I shall give you a boy who will be your grandson. This is the magnificent divine prophecy received by his grandfather, Hazrat Mirza Khulam Ahmad, the promised Messiah. His father, Hazrat Mirza Bashiruddin Mahmud Ahmad, Khalifa Tulmasi II, announced on the 26th of September 1909, Allah has given me the glad tiding that I will be blessed with a son who will be a Nasir Adin, helper of faith. He will be committed to serving Islam. It is also said that he, the Messiah, shall die and his kingdom descend to his son and the grandson. These prophecies were fulfilled in the person of Hazrat Hafiz Mirza Nasir Ahmad, Khalifa Tulmasi III. E Nasir Teri Nazar Ka Sarmaya In Yado Se Hum Jite Ji Yado Ke Chaman Mehkaenge Hazrat Hafiz Mirza Nasir Ahmad, Khalifa Tulmasi III, was born to Hazrat Mirza Bashiruddin Mahmud Ahmad and Hazrat Sayyida Ume Nasir Mahmuda Begum Sahiba on the 16th of November 1909 in Qadian. Hazrat Amma Jan and uh, Hazrat Musa Jahan Begum, the wife of uh, the Promised Messiah, she took care of uh, Hazrat Khalifa Tulmasi Salis uh, soon after his birth. And uh, literally, he was uh, brought up all along uh, in the, her custody and um, up until, I think, uh, his marriage. Under the directions of his revered father, he committed the whole of the Holy Quran to memory at the age of 13 in 1922. He learned Arabic and Urdu from Hazrat Mulvi Sarvashah Sahib. Hazrat Mirza Nasir Ahmed Sahib, the Khalifa Tul Masih III, was a highly educated person, not only in religious uh, education, but also in secular education. He joined the Madrasa Ahmadiyya, uh, which uh, is a school for Arabic and religious uh, teachings. Uh, he passed from there and joined Jamia Ahmadiyya, uh, for, from where he did his Malwi Fazl. Uh, degree from the Punjab University. He stood third in uh, Mawli Fazil uh, 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 examination and uh, got top numbers. After the completion of his uh, Arabic uh, education as Mawli Fazil, he joined the government college at Lahore. He did his BA from uh, the government college Lahore and then his father, Hazrat Khalifa Tul Masih II, Razi Allah Ta'ala Anhu, decided that he should be sent to England uh, for further education. On the 5th of August, 1934, he was married to Hazrat Sayyidah Mansura Begum Sahiba, who was the daughter of Hazrat Nawab Muhammad Ali Khan Sahib and Hazrat Sayyidah Nawab Mubarika Begum Sahiba. He then proceeded to England on the 6th of September, 1934, for postgraduate studies at Balliol College, Oxford, and in due course obtained the honours degree of the University of Oxford and later became Master of Arts of the University. While in England, he started the publication of a quarterly magazine, Al-Islam. After completing his education, he returned to India on the 9th of November, 1938. As a returned from the UK after his studies in 1938 and he was uh, appointed in Jamia Ahmadiyya and and as a lecturer, as a professor in, in Jamia Ahmadiyya and then later on became its principal as well. A few years later, he was to become principal of the prestigious TI College, Rabva. Hadrat Mirza Nasir Ahmad Sahib was the first principal appointed of this great institution. 
So we can say that he was the founder, principal of this Talimul Islam College. And under his supervision and guidance, uh, the whole structure of the college was established from nothing. And he organized everything, he arranged for everything. And by the grace of Allah, it was properly functioning at the time of the partition. One can say that by the grace of Allah, in every aspect, the college was really a model for the rest of the educational institutions in Pakistan. And that was all done uh, under the kind supervision and care and uh, guidance of Hadrat Sahib Zada Mirza Nasr Ahmad Sahib, who continued to be the principal of Talimul Islam College right from the beginning, from 1944 to 1965. One of his next appointments was to the post of the president of the Khuddam al Ahmadiyya organization. Majlis Khuddam al as you are aware, was founded in 1938. And uh, the following year, in 1939, Hazur Razakhli Husi Salis Ramullah was appointed as its uh, Sadr, as its president. And at that time, there was no limit to the tenure as well. So he was uh, its uh, president for 10 years till uh, 1949. And thereafter, um, it is not that commonly known even amongst Akhadam as well, that uh, Hazrat Khalifatul Masih Sani Rizdalanho then actually was also, it said, not just at its inception, but also took over the reins because it was a very difficult period uh, leading up to 1954 with the anti riots as well. So uh, as a Khalifa al Masih Sani as a Muslim uh, became uh, for, for a good number of years became its uh, Sadr. And then uh, for the day-to-day -day administration again as a Khalifa al Masih Salis was its uh, Naib Sadr or the Vice President. And he carried on in that uh, position till 1954 uh, till uh, and then, of course, in other capacities as well after that. At the time of partition, he stayed in Qadian, but immigrated to Pakistan on the 16th of November 1947. He was to play a major role in the setting up of the Furkan Force Battalion. Furkan Force uh, was uh, a body of uh, members of the Amdir community. It was uh, the uh, brainchild of uh, Zakhlif Tumasi Sani, as a Muslim ad. And um, it was primarily to ensure that uh, the government of Pakistan, to give the government of Pakistan able-modded people who could serve in Kashmir itself. Because at that time, especially with the, the first war over Kashmir as well from 1948 onwards, it was felt that a lot of members were required to help out in various activities, not necessarily in fighting, but it was similar to perhaps the homeland force, which um, we use in the UK perhaps may be able to relate to. And a lot of sacrifices were made at that time by a lot of individuals. And they lived in very harsh conditions um, in Kashmir, helping out in, in the low-lying areas uh, around the war zones as well. And uh, they assisted the people of Kashmir greatly at that time. Hazrat uh, Khalifa Masi Salis Ramallah, if I uh, remember correctly, was uh, there for, for roughly between a year to two years, from 1948 to 1950, perhaps. And um, again, uh, a lot of uh, members, of some of the brothers were there as well, and a lot of members of the community were there serving at that time, staying away from uh, friends and family, in, in living in very harsh conditions at that time. In 1953, mass riots took place in Pakistan due to Ahmadi opposition. In 1953, a storm of opposition was raised by the non-Ahmadi ulamas against uh, the Ahmadiyya community, demanding that the Ahmadiyya community should be declared a non-Muslim minority in Pakistan. Th hundreds of Ahmadi houses were burned, many uh, were martyred, and these were very difficult times for the Ahmadis in Pakistan. Hazrat Mirza Nasr Masahib, who later became Khalifatul Masih III, was the principal of T.I. College, Lahore. I was also a student in those days in Lahore, and I witnessed all those things uh, with my own eyes. In May 1953, uh, the government decided to arrest uh, some of the top uh, Ahmadis. Hadrat uh, Mirza Nasir Sahib 
was uh, at his uh, residence in Lahore when uh, uh, around uh, four o'clock in the morning uh, an army officer knocked at his door and uh, Hazrat Sahib came out of his uh, residence uh, and the officer said to him that I have uh, warrants of arrest for you. So Hazrat Mirza Nasir Ahmad Sahib uh, told him to wait for a few minutes so that he can finish his Fajr prayer and then he will go with him. And then with a smile on his face he said, uh, I was waiting for you because I knew that you are coming which means that uh, God had already informed him that he was going to be arrested uh, that morning. So they took him to Lahore uh, jail. Uh, a case uh, was lodged against him uh, in which he was imp uh, given the sentence of five years uh, imprisonment. In November 1954, he was appointed president of Majlis Ansarullah. During his tenure as president, he infused a new life into the organization. In May 1955, he served as the president of the Sada Anjuman Ahmadiyya, which office, though honorary, involved the discharge of heavy responsibilities at the center of the organizational pattern of the movement. He carried out the arduous responsibilities of the president diligently, remaining in this position until his election as the Khalifa ten years later. Hazrat Khalifa Tulmasi II passed away at 2 a.m. on the 8th of November 1965. The members of the community converged in large numbers upon Rabwa. The election of the third caliph took place and that happened on 8th of November 1965 and the venue was Masjid Mubarak in Rabwa and the time was 7.30 in the evening after the Isha prayer. The meeting was presided by Hadrat Mirza Aziza Masaib, who was at that time the Nazriyala of Sadr Ajman Ahmadiyya, uh, Pakistan. He presided over the session, and in that meeting, according to these rules and regulations, the election took place. So following these rules and regulations, when the proceeding of the meeting conducted in uh, Masjid Mubarak, through this meeting, Alhamdulillah, that the name of Hadrat Sahib Zada Mirza Nasir Ahmad Sahib was presented, and all members of uh, the Electoral College, they unanimously agreed on that one, and he was uh, in that way elected as the third successor of the Promised Messiah, alayhi salatu waslam. Uh, naturally, those people who were extremely, uh, extremely grieved at the passing away of Hadrat Muslim Aud Razillahu ta'ala anhu, by the grace of Allah, once again, the life came back to those people and they were quite happy and satisfied and full of gratitude that once again, the whole Ahmadiyya Muslim community was again united at the hand of Khalifa Tulmasi. The college met in a deeply prayerful mood and Sahib Zada Mirza Nasir Ahmad Sahib, eldest son of the departed Khalifa Tulmasi, was elected Khalifa Tulmasi III by an overwhelming majority of the electoral college. All the members of the Electoral College entered afresh into covenant of allegiance on his blessed hand. He made a brief address, and then all those who were outside of the Masjid Mubarak, numbering well over 5,000, took the oath of allegiance. As soon as the choice of the Electoral College became known, it was universally felt as if comfort and consolation were descending upon every heart from heaven. On the 9th of November at 4.30 p.m. at the Bahishti Makbara, Rabwa, the funeral led by the newly elected Khalifa was a deeply moving experience for everyone. Hazrat Mirza Nasir Ahmad Sahib, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, was serving the Jamaat as the principal of Talimul Islam College, Rabwa, before he was elected as Khalifatul Masih. When he was elected as Khalifatul Masih, he was 56 years old at that time. The most poignant tragedy of his revered father's death was faced by him when he was elected as Khalifatul Masih III. His father, Hazrat Mirza Bashiruddin Mahmud Ahmad, Khalifatul Masih II, Al Musrahul Maud, Radi Allahu Anhu, had passed away. But he proved to be 
a wonderful source of comfort, satisfaction and consolation to all the members of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Jamaat all over the world. Not only for that time, but also through the series of crises the Jamaat-e Ahmadiyya faced in the future at different times during his Khilafat. The blessed period of his Khilafat lasted for 17 years. From the beginning of his Khilafat, he showed proof of great zeal and drive in the pursuit of the objectives of the movement. On 17th of December 1965, uh, Huzur Taala's first year of his Khilafat initiated the very first project of his Khilafat uh, where he proposed that a network of food banks be created whereby no member of the community should ever go hungry. He also exhorted the members of the community to refrain from all kinds of un-Islamic rituals. The initiative was very successful. One of the most important projects which was also initiated during the early days of his Khilafat was the setting up of the fazl Mal Foundation in memory of Hazrat Khalifa Tulmisi II on the 21st of December 1965. Before his birth, Hazrat Masih made a prophecy which is a very famous prophecy of Muslim Maud in which he said that God will give him a son who will lead the nations and who will uh, be a great man and he will make uh, he will be a nation builder. So we believe that Hazrat uh, Mirza Mahmud Ahmad Sahib Khalifatul Masih II Razillahu Ta'ala Anho was the Muslim Maud. Uh, when he died uh, it was decided that a foundation should be set up uh, which should carry on with the work uh, that Hazrat Khalifa Tulmasi did in his own lifetime. The first project was to write uh, a biography of the life of Hazrat Khalifa Tulmasi II, Rajallahu Ta'ala Anho. The first part of it was done by Hazrat Mr. Tahira Masaib, Rahmatullah uh, which has already been published. There are various other projects uh, which uh, are uh, being done by the Fazl Umar Foundation uh, these days and it has done a lot of work. There are scholarships that are being given by Fazl Umar Foundation for students to go abroad and uh, study. So it's a vast uh, scheme uh, and uh, it, by, by the grace of God uh, they are doing a very, very good job. A new building was constructed for the Khilafat Library in Rabwa, which was one of the projects envisioned by the Foundation. So in 1970, the foundation stone of the Khilafat Library was laid by Hazrat Khalifa Tul Masih III uh, at Rabwa. In 1971, the inauguration ceremony took place. I was present uh, during this uh, ceremony and uh, it has uh, more than 100,000 books now. Uh, I think this is the largest library uh, in the um, outskirts uh, of uh, that particular area. Among various other projects carried out under the auspices of this foundation were construction of a guest house in Rabwa, publication of the book Khukhpat e Mahmud, which contains all the sermons of Hazrat Khalifa Tulmasi II in three volumes. Cash prizes were awarded to scholars who submitted their dissertations to the foundation on a wide variety of topics. On the 12th of March 1966, Huzur introduced the short-term dedication project known as the Vagfe Arzi. The purpose of this project is to promote the learning and teaching of the Holy Quran as well as imparting a religious knowledge to local members. At their own expense, under Vagfe Arzi, thousands of Ahmadis are teaching the Holy Quran to the members of the community, exhorting them to do good deeds and shun evil. The net result of this activity is that members of the Ahmadi Muslim community are receiving religious education and moral training. A famous revelation of the promised Messiah is, Kings will seek blessings from thy garments. This prophecy was first fulfilled during the time of the third Khilafat in the person of Sir Singate, who was elected Governor General of Gambia, West Africa. Mr. Singate, a devout Ahmadi Muslim, was previously president of all the Ahmadiyya branches in Gambia. Once uh, Sangati was elected as head of state of the Gambia, he said fervent prayers, thank Allah 
for his elevation. For some time, he continued to pray. Then after his prayers, he made a, a request. And everybody sees that that was a historic request. And the request was to request that as a helper to Messi the third, that if he could give him a piece of the promised Messiah's garment. In 1967, Huzur traveled to Europe for the first time after becoming Khalifatul Masih. This journey was beneficial in many aspects and significant according to an earlier glad tiding given by God Almighty. Ominous signs of God's support and succor were observed by all. He visited Germany, Switzerland, Holland, Denmark and England. Whilst in Copenhagen, Huzur inaugurated the Nusrat Jahan Mosque on the 21st of July 1967. It's a very impressive mosque. I mean, first of all, it is a very good sign that this mosque is built by women, while women are considered, I mean, those who have nothing to say, nothing to do uh, in, in, in uh, Islam. So they contributed, I mean, even under very, very hard and difficult circumstances, enough money to build these mosques. And um, the Copenhagen mosque, especially the... Um, uh, Denmark Mosque in Copenhagen is a special sign for a modern style of architecture. It is a round mosque, which is a very interesting, I mean, uh, light uh, uh, contribution. Uh, it creates a very, very wonderful atmosphere inside. Huzur conveyed the message of Islam splendidly in all the countries he visited, by holding press conferences and addressing large audiences. He warned the inhabitants of Europe that the only way out of another catastrophe for them was to accept Islam and to turn with true hearts to their creator. In London, Huzur addressed a large gathering on the 28th of July 1967 at Wandsworth Town Hall. Huzur's topic was a message of peace and a word of warning. Uh, Huzur uh, arrived in England on his first uh, tour after the Khilafat in 1967. The UK Jumaat uh, had uh, arranged a huge uh, dinner um, party at the Wandsworth Town Hall and uh, Huzur delivered a speech there which was later on printed uh, uh, by the name of a word of warning uh, and uh, after the speech, you know, this, this was a wonderful speech in which he uh, told uh, the Western people that if they would not return to God uh, they would be destroyed. So the next day uh, and uh, a few days after what also uh, this uh, speech was, re some parts of the speech, speech was reproduced in the newspapers of England and then in the newspapers of the world. So this is a very, it's a small uh, sp um, pamphlet uh, but it's very important because Huzur made some prophecies in it and he warned the Western nation to return to God. While in London, he attended the fourth annual convention, known as the Jalsa Salana of the Ahmadiyya community in the United Kingdom. This was the first annual convention of the community in the United Kingdom graced by a Khalifa. Huzur addressed the Jalsa on the 30th of July 1967. Africa has to play a very important role in the life of man in times to come. On the 4th of April 1970, Huzur embarked on a nine-week tour of West Africa. He visited Nigeria, Ghana, the Ivory Coast, Liberia, Gambia and Sierra Leone. Large Ahmadiyya communities had flourished in these countries for quite some time. Members had longed to see Huzur in person. At last, their intense desire was fulfilled. African Ahmadi men, women, children and even elderly traveled long distances to see Huzur. They chanted heartwarming religious poems and uplifting slogans in their traditional ways. Huzur's inspiring speeches strengthened their faith. During Huzur's epic travel to this continent, many eminent personalities of African countries had audience with Huzur.
and attended the receptions given in his honour. They readily acknowledged educational, social as well as spiritual services rendered by the movement. Newspapers, radio and television gave wide coverage to his travels. In a nutshell, this journey was a tremendous success in many respects. In fact, it heralded a new era of preaching in West Africa. At the end of his visit to West Africa, he arrived in London and in his Friday sermon of the 24th of May 1970 at the Fuzzel Mosque, gave a brief account of the impressions he had gathered in West Africa. He announced a scheme that he had conceived under divine direction of expanding the activities of the movement in West Africa through the establishment of a substantial number of schools and hospitals, which were a great need for the people of Africa. And this scheme, he mentioned it as Nusrat Jahan scheme, and he requested the Jamaat to make available for the scheme to be implemented 100,000 pounds sterling. And that, uh, if, and that should be done within three years if this amount was, because he wanted uh, the, uh, the scheme to start. And the salient points of the scheme was that, um, that this was uh, uh, to be launched in West African, West African countries. On the 26th of June, 1970, he called upon Ahmadi doctors and teachers to volunteer their services for work in Africa and mentioned that if the number of volunteers did not correspond to the need, he would himself select the teachers and doctors who would be required to proceed to Africa. When Hazrat Khalifa al-Masih III, rahimahullah ta'ala, wanted to uh, introduce this divine scheme, there were so many hurdles and difficulties in the way as normally it does happen whenever um, there is any uh, such divine scheme is to be launched. But uh, because of his dynamic uh, leadership and his uh, continuous humble supplications to Allah the Almighty, all these hurdles and difficulties were removed by the grace of God Almighty. And later on, all these schemes which were introduced under this scheme and institutions that were set up in pursuance of this scheme was most gratifying and proved to be very fruitful. When Hazur Razialatalanho announced the Nusra Jahan scheme, lots of doctors, physicians and surgeons volunteered for the scheme. But I suspect that when they volunteered, most of them didn't have any idea of the conditions that they would be going out to work in, moving to parts of rural Africa where there was literally uh, nothing. Small towns and villages, in some cases the clinics didn't have proper buildings and they had very little in the way of medical supplies and medicines and yet the work that they were able to do uh, to uh, tend to the needs of the local people um, were considering the conditions almost miraculous um, and although they, their aim was to help as many people as possible for free they were still successful from a financial point of view such that they were able to build the buildings that they needed, able to uh, equip them with the medical supplies that they needed in order to run their clinics as well as possible. In fact, many of the clinics were so successful that they were able to multiply and open further clinics in other parts of Africa. Um, the Nusrat Jahan scheme for clinics and hospitals has been most successful in countries like Ghana and Nigeria and Sierra Leone and have been a huge boon for the local people over the last 20 or 30 years. In 1970, Huzur again visited Europe to oversee and accelerate the diverse activities of the Jamaat. During this tour, he visited the United Kingdom, Holland, Switzerland, West Germany and Spain. The highlight of the tour was the opening ceremony of the Mahmoud Mosque in Zurich on the 5th of April 1970. During this tour, a large hall adjacent to the Fuzzle Mosque in London was also inaugurated by Huzur on the 23rd of May 1970. It was built in memory of Hazrat Khalifa Tulmisi II and was named after him as the Mahmoud Hall. The foundation stone of this hall was laid by Huzur on the 30th of July 1967.
The hall played a vital role in the progress of the community when it became the hub of the operations for the community's global television channel, MTA International. Huzur toured Spain for the first time from the 25th of May to the 1st of June 1970. During this tour, Allah revealed to him that in future times to come, the Jamaat will have tremendous success and expansion in Spain, which was unthinkable at the time. On the 31st of March 1972, Huzur inaugurated the magnificent Al-Aqsa Mosque in Rabwa, accommodating over 150,000 worshippers. The Ahmadiyya movement was formally initiated in March 1889 and completed its first century in March 1989. Hazrat Khalifa Tulmasi III made an announcement concerning the celebration of the centenary of the movement in the annual conference of 1973, in which he enumerated a number of projects which he had in mind in connection with the centenary. Huzur called upon the community to pledge the amount of 25 million rupees to finance the projects and the celebration of the centenary. The pledges, however, received in this respect were four times the requested amount. But one thing more very importantly, which Hadrat Khalifa Tulmasi Salis Rahimahullah started regarding the celebration of the first centenary, that was the spiritual program for that. So Hadrat Khalifa Tulmasi Salis Rahimahullah he invited the attention of the members of the Jamaat that Jamaat Ahmadiyya firmly believes in the divine sport with the help of Allah Almighty. And everything can be accomplished and can only be accomplished if the divine help is there. For that purpose, everybody was reminded that they should particularly uh, follow those guidelines which Huzur gave in detail. And he pointed out certain prayers, that these are the prayers of the Holy Quran and given by the Holy Prophet وسلم, which the members have to repeat in so many times. In 1973, Huzur embarked upon his third European tour. He visited the UK, Holland, Germany, Switzerland, Italy, Sweden and Denmark. The bigoted section of Orthodox Muslim divines in Pakistan were much perturbed by the announcements of Huzur concerning the centenary celebrations. Time after time, the plans that they had devised for the purpose of stopping the progress of the movement had been frustrated. By the grace and mercy of God, and from each trial, the movement had emerged in greater strength and spirit. Rather than learning a lesson from their repeated experiences, their bitterness and hostility towards the movement had continued to mount, and the announcement of the centenary celebrations put them in a mood of desperation. Well, it was, I think it was in April 1974 when... Um, an incident was, a very unpleasant incident was orchestrated by the mullahs in, on the Rabwa station. And uh, as a result of that, as uh, they had planned, um, a wave of uh, protests, marches and riots were, were created by them throughout the Pakistan against the Ahmadis, Ahmadi Muslims. Um, in those riots, Hundreds of people were actually martyred, they were killed, including women and children. Um, their properties were looted, their houses, their shops, their businesses were burnt. And it was absolutely callous. And the important thing is that throughout these atrocities against humanity, for no reason other than the faith, that the police and the, the, the federal security services, they all were present there in hundreds, but they always stood purely as um, they looked, looked upon and they enjoyed the scenes. They did not intervene, they did not even take any steps to stop uh, this, these atrocities. The community again set an example of perfect steadfastness under extreme suffering and complete confidence in God. The bereaved and the afflicted managed to make their way to the headquarters of the movement, where Huzur applied the healing balm of compassion and love to their lacerated souls and sent them back comforted and consoled. They came with grief-stricken, gloomy faces and went back smiling and cheerful. Well, actually, it's quite ironic because... 
lots of Hamidis and a great deal of n number of Hamidis in Pakistan had very flourishing businesses, large businesses, very profitable businesses, very renowned businesses. And those were burnt and looted and gutted. I have seen those people who started off right from the scratch, from a little box of a shop to start off again. And by the grace of Allah, that uh, the world saw them, that they flourished. They even did, in instances, they even did better than before. They, they, they were back on their feet in no time. And um, it was quite amazing to see that the same people developed their, redeveloped their businesses again back to the same glory, if not better. Under the leadership of their beloved Khalifa Tulmasi, the community at large emerged from the trial stronger, more united and in greater vigor than had been the case before the troubles started. This was something that puzzled the opponents of the movement and which they were not able to comprehend. They felt that a greater effort on their part was called for in order to coerce the members of the movement into submission. There were slogans against the community, processions against the community, meetings were being conducted in various places. And throughout the country, a wave of opposition against the community started. And things went like this. And as a result of that, many Ahmadis, scores of Ahmadis, actually they had to lay down their lives. They became the martyrs of Ahmadiyyat for the sake of Ahmadiyyat, for the truth. And their houses were put on fire. Their properties were damaged. And they were beaten up. They were insulted. They were boycotted. Their food provisions were stopped from them. And, uh, you know, all types of tortures were, is, was inflicted upon them. So those days were actually very, very tough for the community. And on one side, this was happening. On the other side, the movement started by the mullahs of the time that the Ahmadiyya Jamaat should be declared a non-Muslim community. 1974, there was uh, again uh, a lot of instigation against the Jamaat and uh, a lot of anti-Amdiya anti sentiment was uh, fomented by uh, the mullahs uh, at that time. And their main premise was that uh, members of the community, and at least as far as the law, as far as the constitution was concerned, that uh, members of the Jamaat thus be declared non-Muslims. And um, so the government at that time, which was that of uh, the prime minister at that time, was of Akarli Bhutto, and the, his government at that time then proceeded to put this towards the National Assembly. In September 1974, Hazrat Khalif Sunsi Salis Ramullah was summoned to the National Assembly of Pakistan, uh, in which this was again an orchestrated uh, drama by the National Assembly that uh, they um, questioned Hazrat Khalif um, in minutest details. Uh, at length about the doctrines, about the faith, about the basis of the faith of uh, uh, Ahmadiyyat in Islam, to which Hazrat uh, Khalifatul Sikh Salih Ramallah and his team were able to uh, provide answers in so unambiguous and detailed uh, and satisfactory manner that it actually ridiculed, it was as a result, that the, the whole assembly was ridiculed and it made them look ridiculous in their own eyes. Um, Nevertheless, as it had already been planned, the, the motion was carried by the National Assembly. It was sent to the Senate. And within the matter of hours of having been sent, it was passed by the Senate, just as it had been planned. Despite repeated requests, the proceedings of the Committee of the National Assembly have not yet been made public, proof that the opponents of the movement did not emerge with any credit from the proceedings. As has always been the case in the history of the movement, this is only one side of the picture. Naturally, that was very disappointing. That was totally wrong. But the result was that while this decision was taken on one side, there was a lot of people within Pakistan who became more curious. And... Uh, uh, they decided that we should find out what is the reality about that. Instead of taking the decision in this way that, well, if the government has decided, that must be right. There were many, many people in the, all parts of Pakistan 
who became very curious that after all, why this decision has been taken? So let's go and find out. So the result was that more and more people contacted the Ahmadis here and there and demanded for literature and demanded for explanation and wanted to have more and more information. And also, large number of people, they started visiting Rabwa. The, um, the instigation against the Jamaat at that time and after the motion was tabled, uh, there was a lot of anti amdia sentiment and really it was to ensure that the government of that time uh, coerced and, and uh, uh, confirmed and basically through, through the legislative body declared us as non-Muslims. But um, what happened was that uh, once it was, we were declared as non-Muslims, then the mullahs, the, the Maulvis and, and those creating trouble for us uh, thought they had succeeded. And, and, uh, and the riots basically broke up because they had achieved their aim. But uh, such is the way of, of Allah that uh, Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto himself, who, who had instigated this and, and whose government had actually uh, led to us uh, being, at least in the eyes of the law from, for Pakistan itself, being declared as non-Muslims. He himself was, uh, through the instigation of General Zia, in 1979, and, and in, in, in league with the same people, really, who, who had instigated this, uh, then they, they got rid of him, and he was executed after, again, a trial. And um, we ought to be, again, regarded as, as, as a, a divine retribution in some regards for, for, for carrying on with, with declaring us as non-Muslims. In 1975, Hazrat Khalifa Tulmasi III visited the United Kingdom, West Germany, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Holland and Switzerland. Laying the foundation stone of the Nasir Mosque at Gothenburg, Sweden, on the 27th of September 1975, was a momentous event of this tour. In July 1976, Huzur paid a visit to Ahmadi communities in the United States and Canada, Huzur arrived in Washington on the 25th of July 1976 and visited New York, Dayton and New Jersey. This was the first time that an Ahmadi Khalifa had travelled to this part of the world. This was indeed a very successful visit. Various Ahmadis got the opportunity of meeting with the exalted personage and benefiting from his sublime discourses. He attended various receptions and press conferences while he was in North America. One such reception was held at World Trade Center in New York on the 4th of August, 1976. He also attended the 29th Jalsa Salana, the annual convention of USA Jamaats during his visit. First Jalsa Salana of United States of America, it was that any Khalifa attended. One of the most eventful incidents of the Third Khilafat, and indeed of the Ahmadiyya movement, was the Deliverance of Jesus from the Cross Conference that took place in London in June 1978. Huzur arrived in London in June 1978 and the conference itself was opened on the 2nd of June at the Commonwealth Institute in Kensington, London. Literature relevant to the theme of the conference produced by the eminent historians and writers were on display. For this historic event, Believers and friends came to gather information and to be addressed by Orientalists, archaeologists, scholars and theologians of many religions who had been invited from all over the world to speak on their beliefs. The opening ceremony took place before a packed main hall and to overflowing audiences in adjacent halls by television. There were participants from Pakistan, India, Africa, Asia, Europe and the USA. Eminent speakers like Sir Zafrullah Khan and Sahib Zada Mirza Muzaffar Ahmad read their scholarly papers. In his address, Huzur spoke of the total uniqueness and perfection of God, the creator and master of all, and of man's total dependence upon him. He went on to compare the Christian and Islamic teachings, and with support from the Holy Quran, spoke at great length of the deliverance of Jesus from the cross. He conveyed with great love and humility the message to millions. Thousands of Europeans who listened to Huzur's address were impressed by the depth and breadth of his knowledge. Newspapers from around the world, magazines, television and radio carried news of the event in their respective countries. Hazrat Khalifa Tulmasi's visit to London in 1978 
provided him with a unique opportunity to catch a brief glimpse of British politics at the House of Commons. On the 7th of June, he was invited to the House of Commons by Mr Tom Cox, Member of Parliament. In the Members' Dining Room at the House of Commons, over 100 friends of the Ahmadiyya movement enjoyed the warm reception and hospitality extended to them. All the invited guests had the opportunity of meeting the revered head of the Ahmadiyya movement. Huzur spent some time talking to dignitaries. An added highlight to this informal occasion was provided as the House of Commons was in session on that day and a number of members of parliament spent time talking to Huzur. Several religious denominations were represented, including members of the Jewish and Catholic faiths. The visit lasted for over three hours. Concluding the afternoon, Huzur visited the public gallery to observe the House of Commons in session in what is the heart of British democracy. The promised Messiah, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, said, God has conveyed to me that my followers will excel so much in knowledge and insight that they will confound all others with the light of their truth, their reasoning and their signs. This prophecy had been fulfilled in various forms over the passage of time and will continue to do so. During the blessed reign of the Third Khilafat, this prophecy was magnificently manifested in the person of Professor Dr. Abdus Salam. I am a theoretical physicist, and we theoretical physicists are engaged on the following problem. We would like to understand the entire complexity of inanimate matter in terms of as few fundamental concepts as possible. He was a renowned scientist who received the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1979 from the King of Sweden. He was the first Muslim and in fact first Pakistani, to receive this prestigious award. Just by way of background, of course, when my father won the, uh, uh, was awarded the Nobel Prize in October 1979, he received a phone call from the Nobel Foundation uh, that morning. And his immediate reaction upon receiving this uh, amazing piece of news was to come straight to the Fuzzle Masjid in London and offer an awful of prayer. And then he uh, returned back to home and began the various phone calls. And of course, his first phone call was uh, to uh, Hazrat Khalifa Zulmasi III to inform him of the news. And I know I, I wasn't actually there at the time, but my mother told me afterwards that the message from uh, Hazur was of warm congratulations and of how this is a great matter of pride, A, for all Amdi Muslims and all Pakistanis and the whole world over, that the first uh, Muslim to win a Nobel Prize for physics was an Amdi. In 1980, Hazrat Khalifa Tulmasi again travelled to Europe. Huzur inaugurated the Nur Mosque in Oslo, Norway, on the 1st of August 1980. The highlight of this tour was the laying of the foundation stone of the Basharat Mosque in Pedroabad, near Cordoba, Spain, on the 9th of October 1980. This was the first mosque to be built in Spain, 700 years after the Spanish Inquisition. On this occasion, he announced the magnificent Islamic motto love for all, hatred for none. Later, Huzur travelled to Canada and the United States. This was Huzur's last tour of any country outside Pakistan. The tours of Hazrat Khalif al-Masih, Salis, Rahimullah, uh, like any other tours of uh, a Khalifa, is uh, to elevate the spiritual, uh, sort of uh, the um, elevation of uh, the Ahmadis all over the world. And uh, it is uh, the Khalifa who is the man of God. And uh, ultimately, uh, sort of, you know, practically uh, people all over the world, the Ahmadis all over the world, they can't practically come to the Khalifa all the time. So the uh, Hazrat Sahib, Hazrat Khalifa al Masih Sahib, has traveled um, a lot in terms of, you know, uh, to Europe, to uh, to Canada, to to the United States, and uh, there he had the opportunity to, to meet to meet Ahmadis, as well as uh, to actually uh, proclaim the and uh, spread the message of Ahmadiyya through Islam. So um, that was the the first contact those Ahmadis had after a long time, who couldn't actually come to Pakistan all along. So that was one significance that number one Ahmadis could actually get in touch with their beloved Khalifa. Number two, 
even those people who are non Ahmadis or Christians in this West, Western world, uh, Europe or uh, Canada or States, they had the opportunity to listen to the, the words of the Khalifa, the man of God. And that was their opportunity to listen to the true message of Islam. So the message, the, the, the beneficence, the benefit of uh, the visit was twofold for the Ahmadis as well as for the non Ahmadis in general. Hazrat Sayyida Mansura Begum Sahib, the first wife of uh, Khalif al Masih Salis Rahmullah, passed away after a brief illness uh, on the 3rd of December 1981. And uh, she uh, was the daughter of uh, Nawab, Hazrat Nawab Mubarak Begum Sahib the daughter of the Promised Messiah Islam. The children of Hazrat Khalif al Masih Salis Rahmullah from his first wife were Sahibzada Mirza Anna Samad Sahib, Sahibzadi Amtul Shakur Begum Sahib, Sahibzadi Amtul Halim Begum Sahib, Sahibzada Mirza Farid Ahmed, and Sahibzada Mirza Lukman Ahmed. After um the demise of um, his first Begum. Um, in 1982, Khalifa Masih Salis again uh, decided uh, and thought about remarrying. And uh, it was a step he took um, not very lightly. He, he prayed and supplicated um, for 40 days. He also requested the elders of the Jamaat at that time to do Dua Istikhara. And um, eventually he was reassured, uh, divinely reassured, uh, that his uh, supplications had been met and, and that uh, he was comforted that, yes, um, he, he, he felt he was comfortable with proceeding uh, with the marriage. And uh, I, I think on the 11th of April in 1982, um, he, he, was, uh, he had the nikah and he was married to uh, uh, say that. Uh, Taira Siddiqa Saiba, and uh, she is uh, the daughter of a very devout him. The uh, his name was Abdul Majid Khan Saab of uh, Virawal, and um, and uh, this was again in, in, in April 1982, and Azur uh, Mr. Salis Ramalale uh, passed away in June 1982. So the marriage um, was for a few months. Uh, but um, and, and again, it was at that time before that, it was again the Jamaat again felt very comforted by it as well. In June 1982, while Huzur was visiting Islamabad, he suffered a severe heart attack. He passed away on the 9th of June 1982 at 12.45 p.m. in Islamabad at the age of 73. May his soul rest in peace. After his death, Hazrat uh, Khalif Tul Masih, his uh, the janaza was uh, brought to Rabwa. There was uh, the election of uh, the the fourth Khalifa, who was Hazrat uh, Mirza Tahir Ahmad Rahimullah, and uh, it was in the evening of uh, the election that uh, the uh, the janaza the the tfin of the uh, of Hazrat Khalif Tul Masih Sadis Rahimullah took place in Behishti Magbara. And uh, I still remember those uh, those days because I was um, very standing or walking as well all along, along uh, very close to Hazrat Khalif Tul Masih Rabe Rahimullah. So um, I remember very well clearly those days and that special evening because uh, they were like it was unimaginable because it was like hundreds and thousands of people all over. So wherever uh, one could see, it was like a crowd, and uh, people had gathered from all over the world to uh, to offer their respects and to participate in the janaza of Hazrat Khalif al Masih Salis Rahimullah. Huzur's passing was a grievous loss to the community, but everyone bore the tremendous loss with fortitude, keeping in view the sublime teachings of Islam. During the 17 years of his Khilafat, Hazrat Khalifa Tul Masih III with his unique leadership and strength, was certainly able to expand and serve the Jamaat remarkably. 
उसके सूरत हसी उसके सीरत हसी वो शुता दहन वो कुशादा जबे दरस अहले वफा को यही दे गया प्यार सब से किसी से भी नफरत नहीं 